Welcome to Valley Grove Baptist Church, located at 1731 South, U.S. Highway 281 in Stephenville, Texas. We are glad you joined us for our 1030 Sunday morning worship service. If you'd like to learn more about Valley Grove, please check us out at our website at valleygrove.net. Now, join us for the morning worship service already in progress.
So let's pray that God be at work in us even here today and we allow Him to do so. Right now, let's share the love of Christ with one another. Stand and greet one another. Glad you're here this morning.
pray that it's that way so that it's a uh, evidence, an example for these young people. Father, help us to live that way before you. And show them by how we live that we are following you. And Father, help us to teach them to do the same. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thanks, God. Let's stand together and sing this song. It's a different time to hear.
shines and that we can follow you, Lord, and that you call us out to be the one to help define those boundaries of what we have to hold before us. We just ask that you would bless this time, Lord, and we ask that your presence um, dwells in this place, Lord. We thank you for all the blessings of life. In your name we pray. What is the focus and the desire and the drive of your heart and your life today? What do you, what do you strive for? And this next song we, we're going to sing here in a few moments, it talks about what our life and our desire is. It talks about three different things, holiness, righteousness, and faithfulness. That should be the, the striving of every believer here in this place and all around the world. In our heart and life, we should strive for holiness. Because God is holy and we want to be like Him. Our strive as a Christian and as a believer is to be faithful and to seek righteousness and to be righteous. That's what the song talks about. Let's stand together, let's sing the song together. Take my life. Holiness, this is what I long for. Let's sing together this song.
Thank you, Lord, for taking my place. God, I just pray that each person knows the sacrifice and know, know what you did so that we can have eternal life. Lord, if there is some, someone that here today has never placed their personal faith and trust in you, God, I pray, Lord, that today will be the day of salvation, that today they give their life to you, Father. God, I pray for the one who's walked away. Lord, I pray for the one who needs to return to a right relationship with you. God, I pray that today, God, you speak to hearts, God. I pray, God, that you come, allow people to come to this altar who need to lay down some requests, need to lay down some things here in this place. God, I just pray whatever needs to be done that you have your own way. God, I pray that you bless this offering. I pray, pray that today you bless the gift and the giver today. Pray for our pastor as he comes in a few moments to break open the word of God. I just pray that you strengthen him, and I pray you give him recall, Lord. I pray that you give him boldness as he shares, Lord, a difficult scripture. But God, I just pray that you just allow him to have the freedom, Lord, to speak. God, I just pray, Lord, whatever the, whatever the need is in this place, God, I pray that you have your will. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the freedom we have in this country to come and to worship and to praise you. God, we pray for those churches, Lord, across uh, the world and other countries, Lord, who do not have the freedom, who are meeting in secret, yet we walk in publicly, we walk in, and Lord, we just come to worship, Lord, I pray that you'll bless them, Father. We will work in a mighty way, Father. In your name we pray. Amen. As you're being seated, we're going to continue to worship the Lord with the singing of the song. In your name.
simple, I'll make it a little easier. Uh, I don't you know, anticipate uh, anything being you know, too bad about it, but I do want to give you that, that, uh, that warning. We're going to talk about some things that the leaders might uh, be careful with. So let me just give you that. Help me finish this, uh, this, this term. We've all heard the term. Someone is as different as day and night or as daylight and dark, right? And we, we understand, it's like we're talking about in the, in the children's church, we understand that the differences are in the terms. The, the idea is, is that there's, there's no question as to uh, the distinguishment between the two. Maybe you're talking about uh, two kiddos raised by the same parents. Well, those kids are as different as daylight and dark. You know, we come from the same parents, but they're as different as night and day. Or maybe even talking about a, a person at different times in their life. You know, well, from what they used to be to what they are today, it's different as night and day. And, and the, the idea there is that something is just, just without question. The difference is so distinguished that it's really without question. Well, Scripture speaks in those terms. Michelle read a passage from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7 that speak in those regards. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5, where we're going to be today as we continue walking through Ephesians. Last Sunday we covered the first couple of verses of, of Ephesians 5. Today we're going to get a bigger piece. And actually, we're going to start again here in, in verse 1. But right now, look down there at verse 8. Ephesians chapter 5 beginning in verse 8, Paul writes this, For you were once darkness, but now you are light. Live as children of the light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitful, fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. Paul there is, is again talking about this black and white, this darkness and light, saying, listen, there ought to be such a distinguishment between believers and followers of Christ that it's daylight and dark is the difference. Jenna and Hannah and I went up and ate uh, at uh, Mary's Cafe in Strong. How many of you have been there? Yeah. I don't even know why they bring a menu, right? I mean, you go over the chicken fried steak and go there, right? But if they had, if we had wanted to look at something else, there would have been no possible way. We walk in and it's just like darkness. The only light is from one window and a few of the neon lights, right? There's no way you know, to read anything. It's just shadows. Well, sometimes we try to live in the shadows rather than in the light, staying in the light. Scripture calls us to be living lights, to be oh, children of the light, to walk in the light. For God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. And so as His followers, as His children, we're called to walk in the light. Interesting quote I read recently, in all the troubles that the country of Greece has been going through, and, and yet all the history that has happened uh, from that country, one of them made a statement that uh, was in a story that I read. It said this, talking about this birthplace of the Western civilization, civilization as Greece is. It said this, it said, we gave light to the world, but we held on to the darkness. Man, what a statement. A sad statement. We gave light to the world, but what we held on to was the darkness. I want us to think about the light and the darkness. Things as we talk this morning. As we begin, let's pray together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us this morning. We thank you that you are mindful of us. We thank you, Father, for your love, mercy, and grace that you freely bestow upon us. Father, we pray that you captivate our minds and our ears, our attention, our hearts this morning as we yield them to you. Speak to us, Father. I pray that the words that come out of my mouth will not be my words, but your words. Let your truth be spoken today. And let it bring you glory. And let it edify us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, let's begin in verse 1 this morning. We'll cover again verses 1 and 2 as we go on down and then pick up in verse 3. Because there's this verse 1 theme that is kind of the umbrella of all the chapters. 
And that is where Paul says, Therefore, as dearly loved children, be imitators of God. And that theme is going to continue to run through uh, this chapter. He says, Be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Then verse 3. But among you, in other words, we're going to, he's going to start telling us how can we be imitators of God? How can we live out this life of love and the imitation of God? He says, verse 3, but among you, and he's writing to the church, so to believers, but among you believers, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be any obscenity, foolish talk, coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather <coughs> thanksgiving. Let's pause there for just a moment. When Paul says there, there must not even be a hint. The Greek word there, if we take and kind of break it down and expand it, he said basically, there should be none of these things even named among you. There should be no hint of these things among you. We often sometimes just attach it to the, to the first thing there of sexual morality, but actually that even goes on to attach to impurity or greed or anything other improper that he continues to talk about. Paul says, I don't even, there should not even be a hint of it among you. Now, why would he say that? I mean, Paul, we're an imperfect people. How can there not even be a hint of it? Now, remember what the overall theme of this chapter is. Be imitators of God. Is there a hint of any of these things in God? No. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. So there, therefore, there's not even a hint of these things in, in God. And so He calls on us as imitators of God. Therefore, there not be a hint of any things, of any of these things in us. When I was in the CPA uh, field, one of the, one of the rules that we went by in CPA audits was that there was not to even be an appearance of, uh, of a lack of independence upon us as auditors. Not even the appearance of a lack of independence. It was somewhat Paul said here, not even a hint of it. In other words, if there was even an appearance of a lack of independence, even though there was not an independence, independence that had been violated, even the appearance of it should cause us as CPAs to step away from the engagement. Because we want the, the trustworthiness of those of the audit to be such that no one questions the trustworthiness of it. Such is what Paul is saying here to believers. There should be such a trustworthiness of us as believers in the lives that we live that there's not even a hint of these things among us. Peter says it this way, 1 Peter 2 and 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and give glory to God on the day that he visits us. Whenever I uh, lived in Sweetwater, I had the opportunity to serve on the board of Hendrick Hospital. And there was a wonderful gentleman there that uh, served with, and just a wonderful man. His name was Monroe Leverance. Now, Monroe had started, uh, I think it was Abilene Copy or Abilene Business Machine or something like that. His family had known it for several years. They sold copiers and in the day typewriters and all kinds of supplies and everything else. Now, Hendrick employs some 2,500 people. Okay? Some billion dollars in, in, in the gross revenue. So a huge company there in the scene of Abilene. But Monroe had it in, in, in such as he was serving on the board that he wouldn't even bid on any of the office products or any of the coppers. Nothing. He did no business with the hospital. And he and I were visiting one day and I said, Monroe, why don't you? I mean, he's just make a bid. I mean, the committee you know, will choose the bid and they'll go with the best bid. He said, you know, I want no one to ever question why I serve on this board. He said, I serve here because I believe in the work we do for the Lord and the serving that happens here. And I want that to never be questioned. I don't want the integrity of my name to ever be questioned and be serving for the Lord this way. He said, I'd rather walk away from the business, lose money, than to have that be questioned. That was a very powerful statement. Really what Monroe is doing is striving to live out these verses. That there not even be a hint of greed or immorality among you. He said, I don't want that to tarnish my testimony or my name. Such as it is, it's what God calls us to live, the life he calls us to live. As believers, I want it to be so evident in the world around you that they know that you're a follower of Christ. Does that mean we have to be perfect? Absolutely not. But whenever we create those times of imperfection, how we handle them, how we come back from them, what we learn from them, how we forgive, how we seek forgiveness, 
even in those times, it brings glory to the name of Christ. Well, let's look again at some of the things that, that Paul tells us should not even be a hint of things around us. He says of sexual morality, of any kind of impurity, uh, or of greed, or obscenity, of foolish talk, or coarse joking. It sounds like a headline out of today's newspaper, doesn't it? Somehow along the way we have uh, convinced ourselves in our world that, uh, that everything is new. Somehow even in, in, in the church we have this understanding that our society today has a patent on depravity. That no one ever before our generation has gone before has had to deal with the things we've had to deal with. The scripture reminds us there's nothing new under the sun, even the man's depravity, even of the sin that is among us. Well, let's look at some of these things Paul says should not even be a hint among us. One is of sexual immorality. Now, in today's world, that's something that's very proper. TV, internet, magazines, books, whatever it is, we find that this is readily available among us. In our earlier lifetime, we would, uh, hadn't even, wouldn't even view, uh, think of seeing a married couple share the same bed on TV. They would be in separate twin beds as a married couple. Today, we see those improper relationships happen on just about every TV show uh, that's on it. So it is certainly something prevalent among us. How would Paul know anything about that in his day? I mean, they didn't even have electricity. What's going on in Paul's day? Well, Ephesus was the center of the goddess of pagan worship of uh, fertility, Diana. And so they had a huge temple that people all around the world came there to Ephesus to participate in all kinds of immoral lives. There in the temple, part of the temple worship. And so they knew deviance and depravity in a very major way because it was lived out among them. And many of the people of Ephesus participated in such. So Paul understood very clearly what it was to live those things Here recently, much discussion has been made about homosexuality. Is it approved by God? Is it not approved by God? We, this last Wednesday night, made a proclamation of the law of the church, defining marriage in biblical terms as one, one man and one woman. Why would we do that? Are we haters? Are we you know, just not understanding? Are we not kept up with the times? Well, the reason that we make such statement is because we go to God's Word for His truth. And His truth is a guidance that is, that is not bound by time. It is a truth that understands throughout time. And truth is truth. This is something that they dealt with in Paul's day. It's not something new to us in our day. This is something they've dealt with for thousands of years. Turn with me to Romans chapter 1. Why is it that we would make such a statement, pass such a, such a Bible? What is it that Scripture says that would lead us to think that God is against some, such activity? Paul says here in, in Romans 1, we'll begin in verse 24. But in the previous verses, he's talking about the evidence of God being clear before man. And in other words, the creation that, that God has given evidence to himself, to his great power, to his divine nature. But he says that man has ignored this. And then he picks up in verse 24, says this, Therefore God gave them over to their sinful desires, the sinful desires of their heart, to say, and to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. The same thing we see happening today has been happening for thousands of years. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Verse 26, because of this, God gave them over to their shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations uh, with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men, received in themselves a new penalty of their perversion. That's strange, uh, strong language. It's not something that I'm you know, terribly comfortable in reading, but... Uh, and something I know you're not terribly comfortable in hearing, but the truth of it is this. These things were happening in biblical days. It's not new to us. 
Some have twisted the word and said, ah, oh, you know, the relationships that, that, that Paul is addressing is, is that of, a, of an older male and then a younger one. And so really what you have is someone taking advantage of, of another. No. It says they lusted after one another. That's a mutual relationship. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they gave in to their humanity and the lust of that instead of taking the truth of God and applying to their hearts. This was happening then. This happens now. Why do we take the stand we take against it? Not because we're hateful people, because we just want to stand on the truth that God has given us. Amen. It's not wrong because I say it's wrong. That five dollars will go get you a cup of coffee. Maybe it's Starbucks, right? My opinion is not one that matters. It's God's opinion. That's what we stand for, right? And so that's the stand that we take. Hey, but lest we think that it's just a single sin that you know God warns us against, Paul continues on there in chapter five because there are many other things that he warns us against. He talks of other kinds of impurity, of, of greed. He talks about. Um, Foolish talk, coarse joking, obscenity. What's the source of greed? The source of greed is covetousness. Me coveting what you have. As we were growing up, my dad was always fond of saying, as he'd see somebody with a new tractor, a new implement, a new piece of equipment, he'd go, man, I wish I had that tractor and they had a feather. <laughs> Why? He said, that way we'd both be tickled, right? <laughs> yeah, he was joking. <laughs> But you know, the truth is, is that kind of coveting happens in our heart and all of a sudden it spills out on us and that coveting then turns into greed and it starts, us, starts making, uh, having us make decisions that go against God's Word. Hey, and unless we think that greed is only uh, a danger or temptation of the rich, be careful, greed can happen no matter our social status. Greed can happen if we have nothing as we covet what our neighbor has or greed can happen when we have everything just holding on to that for security rather than our security in the eternal God Almighty. Greed happens regardless of social status. You know, some of the, the trouble with, with, with the lottery is that it's greed on both sides. It's greed on our lawmakers as they, they put something out there that takes advantage of those who have the least and causes them to put money where they don't need to be tempted to put money. It causes greed on the other end as people put their hopes and dreams in winning the lottery and then that will solve all their problems. And so it's actually just something that has greed on both sides. So greed is not something of social status, it's something of the heart. Paul talks about the impurity, this, this uncleanliness, this something that puts our eyes on the things of the world, the creation rather than the creator. You know, that's the source really of all sin is when we get our eyes off of the Creator and we put it on the creation and we start doing things with the creation that God did not intend for us to do. When we start lusting or, or, or seeking after the creation rather than the Creator. And it puts us in this form of idolatry. We had a quote from last uh, Sunday's bulletin by St. Augustine. It says, right is right even if no one is doing it. And wrong is wrong even if everyone is doing it. And who is the determiner of right and wrong? It's not you or I. It's not society. It's not popular opinion or majority. It's God Almighty. Amen? Amen? And it's only on His truth that we can truly stand. See, one of the things I want us to understand here what Paul is teaching us is God is not anti-sex. On the contrary, He blesses it within the boundaries that He has established as Creator. That He has rightfully established as Creator. Who is He to tell us what to do with our bodies? He's the Creator, God Almighty. He has every right to tell us what to do. Don't want to listen? Understand there are consequences in that. It doesn't make what you decide to do right. He's Creator. He gets to decide those things. But within the boundaries that He has given us, it is good and right. And these boundaries aren't burdensome. They're good because they are healthy and right as He has determined them for us. But I will tell you that it's hard to live that life out in the world. I don't know if you've uh, seen some of the stories of the past couple of weeks of Russell Wilson. He's a quarterback for the Seattle Seahawks. Won the Super Bowl two years ago, last year, lost it at the very end of the game. Um, Russell is a, is a uh, professing Christian in, in 
strives to be alive in the world in a very difficult time. He's dating, he's dating a girl named Sierra. She sing? Is that what she does? Okay, all right. So she's a very popular singer, because I know all about her. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so he was in a church in San Diego here a couple of weeks ago, and they were interviewing him, and they were talking to him, and they were talking about his relationship with Sierra, and he said, well, we've chosen to have our relationship, you know, follow and do it Jesus' way. And I go, oh, what does that mean? He said, well, we're, we're abstaining from, from any kind of relations that way until marriage. Talk show people, columnists, everybody had a field day with him. Is he stupid? Is he just dumb? Is he ignorant? Why would he do that? I mean, this girl is beautiful, and he's popular, and he's rich. They just cannot fathom that somebody would surrender themselves to God in that way. is exposing, hey, this is the way of God. God said this is the good and right way. This is the blessed way. The darkness doesn't understand. There will be times that we make a stand because of what God has led us to do. And the world around us goes, you're crazy, you're stupid, you're dumb. Why would you do that? Light in the darkness. The darkness will not always, always understand. But that doesn't mean we cease to be light. God's ways are not burdensome. They're healthy and right. God is not anti-money, but He is anti-greed. He is a generous God with His people, and he is He's called on us as His people to be generous. God is generous with His money towards us. He is generous with His love, His forgiveness, His help, His joy, His kindness, His patience, His gentleness, His goodness. He has been generous towards us in all these things, and He calls on us to be generous towards Him and towards others. He's not a stingy God. He is not a greedy God. He's generous. And therefore, when we seek to imitate Him, we seek to imitate Him with generosity. We seek to be generous towards Him with what He has given to us. And we seek to be generous towards others with what He has given us. Isn't it a bit ironic that if we pray to God to bless us in the area of finances in our lives, but yet we choose to be stingy towards Him, those things don't seem to match up. God calls on us to be generous towards Him. He's been generous towards us first. Amen? Amen. He calls us as imitators of Him to do likewise. But He calls on us also to be generous with those around us. I'm not always the best at it, but I strive to be better because I understand there's a certain amount of testimony in it. But my wife will tell you that I haven't always been the best tipper whenever we go out to the restaurants. And so I always kind of look to her and be like, you good with that? And sometimes I give a thumbs up and sometimes I give down, but I try to get better, right? True? Change your perspective. Have one of your children go and be a waiter or waitress. Change your perspective. I had another brother of Christ tell me, he said that changed his totally completely. He said, now he said, I try to tip each and every waiter or waitress as though they were my child. Okay? Why don't we say all that? Because in the totality of our testimonies, there's truth that everything matters. I don't get to sit down and have a conversation with each and every person in life. But they're going to see the way I act and see the things I do. And if I act generously towards them, then there's going to be a good witness, a good testimony in that. If, if I withhold in, in a stingy manner, then there's a witness and a testimony that goes along with that. I say that not to hold this captive, but I say that to be understanding and thoughtful. That in everything, as God has been generous towards us... Let us too be generous towards others and in doing so be a witness for God. Likewise, Paul talks about coarse joking or, or a foul talk or obscenity. Do you think God ever told a dirty joke? So far we're kind of wavering. This means yes, this means no. No, right? No, God never told a dirty joke. He is light, in Him there is no, uh, no darkness. So coarse joking, coarse talking, obscenity, they don't come out of God's mouth. Why should they come out of ours as His followers? Being imitators of God means that we should walk and talk like Him. I don't 
don't care if we're sitting around with the guys and somebody else told one. It's not coming out of our mouth. In fact, we really ought to leave the situation so that we are not a party to it. So that we're not giving our, our approval to it. God is careful with His words. He says what He means. His words are not careless. He's not foolish or obscene with His words. He's not known for curse words or dirty jokes. And neither should His children be. Being imitators of God means we do as the Father does. And we don't as the Father doesn't. Paul says, among you there shouldn't even be a hint of these things. Why? Because there's not a hint of them in our Father. Now we're not going to be perfect every time. We're going to mess up. And God knows that and He understands that. And when we do, when we come to Him seeking forgiveness, seeking to, to, to repent of what we've done and learn from it, He is there willing and ready to do those things. We should be with others. We should also be mindful that the testimony of our lives is witnessed by others. The testimony of our lives is not doing what we think is right. The testimony of our lives is doing what God tells us is right and not doing what He tells us is wrong. And not changing those things up and exchanging the truth for a lie and going, oh, well, but God is love, so He doesn't want this to happen. That might hurt somebody's feelings. Hey, if God calls it a sin, it's a sin. Not if I believe it, not if I like it, or if I dislike it. If He calls it a sin, it's a sin. He is creator. It's to make that clear. And therefore, what is sin? I don't condone and say, well, that's good. That's okay. Just do it well and do it right. Sin drives us away from God. Sin is called to be to repented of so that we can return to Him in fellowship. It's not something to be rejoiced or celebrated in our lives. Let's pick up in verse 5 as we close. Paul says this, For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has an inheritance in the kingdom of God. Strong words. Why? Because what Paul is saying is, listen, don't claim the name of Christ and then go off chasing idols and living according to those idols, idols and say, hey, I'm a follower of Christ. No, you're a follower of the idol. That's all Paul's saying. He said, at least be honest. Don't claim to be a follower of Christ and be a follower of the idols. It doesn't mean that we're without sin, but he said, let's be honest. What is it that has rule in our life? So verse 6, he says, Let no one deceive you with empty words of fine talk. For because of such things, God's wrath comes upon those who are disobedient. But therefore, do not participate with any of those in their deeds. This is what he says up here. For us. He says, people that, that do those deeds, and, and even if they have fine talk, he says, don't participate with them in those things. When things are contrary to God's word, make a stand in God's word, for this is... A few years ago, Bill Clinton, well in his first inaugural address, made this statement to arouse the applause. He said, there's nothing wrong with America that cannot be cured with what's right with America. And us and our patriotism, we, yeah, yeah, what's right with America, we can cure any of our wrongs. And yet, some 152 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, our country still battles with racism. How come all of this right had cured the wrong fully completely? After 51 years and some $22 trillion of government spending in the war on poverty, 45 million Americans still live in poverty. 1971, when President Nixon announced a war on drugs. Some 44 years later, an annual expenditure of $51 billion, 47% population above age 12 has admitted to using the little ones. And we're not going to cure what's wrong with our nation or what's wrong with our world by our strength, by what we think is right. There's only one way these things get better, and that's by yielding ourselves to the Creator, God Almighty, to the presence of Jesus Christ in our lives and following His truth and His ways. Amen? Amen. Anything else?
You know, it's difficult times we live in. I don't know that they're any more difficult than any other time in history. But they say difficult for us. But no matter the time of history, the assignment for followers of Christ is always the same. Be light. Be a living light in the world of darkness around you. See, over these past uh, generations, we've kind of uh, told ourselves that America's light. Everything's good in our society. Everything's going the right way. And so we've kind of taken a little time off about being steady, committed, obedient followers to the ways of the light and everything we do. We've been given some wake-up calls. Paul gave a wake-up call there to the church at Ephesus. Hey, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God because there is no darkness in Him. There should be a hint of it in you. And where you find it, weed it out. So that what you reflect is a true representation of the God you follow. There's only one way we do that. And that's by decreasing in ourselves and letting Christ increase in us. By strengthening that relationship with Him. You can't be good enough on your own. It takes Christ in you. Amen? You can't be saved of your own. It takes yielding your life to Christ. You can't get better, stronger on your own. It takes the Holy Spirit working you and working me in order for that to happen. Today we take an assessment. For some here today, they've never yielded their lives to Christ. And Christ is not going to isn't it time? Isn't it time that you gave your life to me fully and completely and let me be king? Your way hadn't worked, and it's not going to. My will. And my will bring you eternal life. Some of you here this morning, that's the decision for you. Some, if you've taken an inward examination of your heart this morning by the power and the lens of the Holy Spirit, God's sown you some hints. God's shown you some places in your life where there's hints of things that ought not be. And he said, those things need to be yielded to me. So that the reflection to the world around us is light. Not dim, but burning bright. Light. And the lights. We need to give those hints to him today. God's asking some of you to surrender in various ways. He's talking to everyone.